So, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League. It's been out for well over a month now, and I assume most, if not all of you watching this, are aware of its mid-league reception and tremendously low player count at launch, which is not an ideal start for a fully priced live service game. Ever since it got a proper gameplay reveal last year, it has had a ton of heat and critique slung in its direction for almost a year now. And now, with a less than ideal launch and overall review consensus, it's more than likely going to be treated as the butt end of a joke for quite some time in video game discussions. It kind of already is at this point, and I understand to an extent. Nine years for this game from this legendary studio that made these legendary games was bound to disappoint most. Now, why do I say all of this? Am I too another consumer who has been betrayed and unjustly wronged by this video game? Do I also hate this game's guts and everything it stands for? No, not at all. I actually like this game. I think it's very fun, it has a ton of room to improve, does a lot of really cool things with its characters including having the coolest iterations of almost all of them in my opinion, but I would be lying if I didn't say that the narrative underwhelmed me, that the tagline kill the Justice League doesn't live up to its potential, that the live service model is incredibly pervasive, that the current monetization model is disgusting, and that I was sold a fully priced video game where it only feels like I received a third of it and the rest of it will be trickled in over the next one to two years resulting in an incomplete AAA experience in a landscape where you've gotten complete ones for the same price and where live service games are dropping like flies. And most importantly, it's an online only $70 game that you cannot play if the servers go down. Oh my goodness, why are companies like this? Don't you fools realize that you're just signing your game's own death certificate when you do shit like this? Anyways, everywhere I go on the internet, this game is shrouded in negativity and I understand a lot of it. Is it a great game? As of right now, I don't think so. But I also don't think that this is a bottom of the barrel, total dog shit video game that a lot are making it out to be. To me, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is a very interesting game to navigate through and talk about because there is a lot to discuss, which is what I wanna do with this video. But before I talk about anything in the now, I wanna start from the very beginning and give you an insight to my excitement for this game. From when the game was first announced, to the yearly update trailers, to the pre-release marketing cycle, all the way to the game's launch. And to do that, we need to go back to 2020. Hey, Metropolis! Do you like live executions? Well, don't touch that dial! In 2020, during the global pandemic, DC hosted an event called DC Fandom and showed off a bunch of their upcoming stuff. Wonder Woman 84, Black Adam, The Batman, the new Suicide Squad movie. But the thing I was really looking forward to was Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, which was teased a little bit before the event. I'm waiting for a bit, you know, perusing through all the shit that's coming out, and the trailer finally comes on, and even though I strongly dislike strictly CG video game trailers, I was pretty invested in this one. The squad of Harley, Deadshot, Captain Boomerang, and King Shark was an interesting lineup. Hearing them banter with each other was entertaining, and then watching them just tear up aliens and Metropolis together was really cool. Then Superman shows up and lasers this pilot to ash, and then the tagline comes up and the release is slated for 2022, and I was like, kill the Justice League? Fuck yeah, sign me up. From there, I was just speculating out of my mind, who's gonna be in this Justice League? Flash, Batman, Superman, Wonder Woman, and Green Lantern were givens to me, even this early on. But I was thinking way above the clouds, like, is Aquaman gonna be here? How do we even fight him? Is Hawkgirl even a thing yet? What about Cyborg? Where's Martian Manhunter? How many more squad members are there gonna be? Am I gonna see Enchantress, or El Diablo, or Katana, or Deathstroke, or Parasite, or Cheetah, or Reverse Flash, or Black Manta as playable characters? If Aquaman and Black Manta were in this game, would Manta just murder Waller and the Suicide Squad and just go after Aquaman himself? And will some of them actually die in the story based on your decisions? It was a tough year, and this trailer just had me so excited to see what was on the horizon. It was so cool to see Rocksteady focus on new DC characters that weren't in the Arkham games, and as a result, I was re-watching this trailer over and over again trying to pick out details, and I was fantasizing for weeks, man. I was hype. Then, Radio silenced for about a year until we got two separate trailers late in 2021 that showed off more of the game and what it would be, and I loved what I saw. The premise of the Justice League being controlled by Brainiac was dope, non-infected Wonder Woman fighting an infected Superman looked really cool, Metropolis looked amazing, and the gameplay and the action just looked so frantic and chaotic, and the small snippet we saw of the Flash boss fight at the time looked hype, and it was still slated for 2022. 
2022 came around and early on in the year, the game got delayed to 2023, which made sense. In that time frame, COVID was having a dramatic impact on game development, so whatever, let them cook. They dropped another trailer at the Game Awards that year showing off Batman and also commemorating the late and great Kevin Conroy. Then 2023 came around, and nearly three years after it got revealed, we still hadn't seen any real gameplay for it, and it was coming out in May of that year. Thankfully, in March, two months before launch, PlayStation blessed us with a long look at this game, and uh, yeah, people were not pleased with what they saw, and that's me being generous. Complaints spanned over topics of it being a live service, it being a looter shooter, having a battle pass, prioritizing gunplay over the kits of the characters, having a bunch of numbers on screen which scarred people after games like Gotham Knights and Avengers, and a bunch of other shit. This 15 minute presentation single-handedly dissipated three years worth of anticipation for the general public. I have never seen a game get turned on so quickly in my life. Now, what did I think of the game after this presentation? I was still pretty amped for it, honestly, mostly because of the gameplay and the story setup. Seeing real-time gameplay for it made me think of Crackdown but with the Suicide Squad, and I was really into it. The verticality and traversal on display looked so cool, and the seamless integration of traversal and gunplay with each character having their own method of traversal just looked really fun. I honestly didn't understand the qualms about the gameplay itself on a surface level because they showed this in previous trailers. It was in front of us the whole time. You saw these motherfuckers flying around and shooting, and no one said anything about it before this presentation. And this story bit with Wonder Woman and The Flash only bolstered my interest in the game's story. The live service stuff, however, did leave me skeptical as well because it was being published by WB, who had already gotten their grubby little fingers into the likes of Injustice, Mortal Kombat, and Multiverses. I think they have surpassed EA in being the scummiest video game company on the planet, but I'll get to that later. I was well in the minority for my thoughts on Suicide Squad since nearly every outlet and content creator I came across was not confident in this game at all, but I was still looking forward to the game, even though it was squished between Tears of the Kingdom and Street Fighter 6, and I was wondering how the fuck I would have time to play it in an already stacked year. But then, it got hit with another delay immediately, all the way to 2024. So again, another period of radio silence until late in the year where they started to release these insider episodes and more trailers, and you know, they were still hitting for me. The gameplay, setting, visuals, and story still sold me, but what I was really curious to learn about was the live service model and how it would work in the game itself outside of cash shops and cosmetics, and they were going with Elseworlds, which made sense to me. Anything DC related with a speedster involved causes me to immediately speculate that the multiverse will be part of it somehow, especially for a premise where you kill some of the most beloved characters in media, so that was kind of expected. I was also really relieved to hear that they wouldn't be doing FOMO content, and the roadmap with new characters and new stuff sounded cool, though parts of me remained skeptical of how honest the live service promises would end up being in the long run, I was still pretty much on board for whatever they had in store. But it still felt like a lot of discussions surrounding this game were done so in bad faith, and I'm not talking about critiques of the gameplay loop or the live service model or anything like that, but I mean just engaging with this game with skewed perspectives of what people wanted this game to be rather than what it actually was, which only worsened when the story got leaked. I saw a good amount of reactions of people being shocked that you killed a Justice League in a game called Hold on, let me, let me read my notes here. Suicide Squad, <clears throat> kill the Justice League. I get not liking the premise of killing your beloved heroes, but come on. So, after a very messy year of promotion and discourse surrounding this game, it finally comes out. And man, where do I begin? I thought I was gonna have to hunt you jailbirds down. Like dogs. I want to start off at the top with the overall visuals and presentation because oh my goodness, Rocksteady's art team is fucking cracked. This is one of the best looking games I have ever seen. Everything from the use of color, to the aesthetics, to the effects, to the fidelity, to the character models, to the character designs, all the way down to the facial animations. This game sports the best facial animations ever. For a long time, I heralded RGG as being the best studio when it came to character faces because of how they're able to illustrate character stories and personalities just by how they look, on top of incredible facial expressions during heavy hitting scenes where the games need them the most. 
but after playing Suicide Squad, Rocksteady are at the top of the mountain now. A lot of this game's comedy and drama work because of the character faces, especially Harley, Boomerangs, and Wonder Woman's. It's amazing work. I was consistently impressed throughout the entire game. Then we move to the characters themselves, and I am going to sound like a broken record during this portion, so buckle up. This is one of the best versions of Harley. Her costume and overall look are fantastic. This is the best version of Captain Boomerang, perfectly capturing his overgrown, raggedy ass douchebagginess. This is the coolest version of King Shark, making him Atlantean was a great call. Though I am not that into this default Deadshot suit, this is one of the best versions of Floyd Lawton I've seen. Though I prefer Gizmo's design from the old Teen Titans show, this is a really good rendition of an older Gizmo. I've never heard of Hack before, so I looked up what she normally looks like in comics and uh, yeah, best looking Hack ever. This is an amazing rendition of Toy Man. This is a really good Lex Luthor. He just looks like a slimy asshole. Then we get to the legendary Justice League. And let me just say, these are hands down the best these characters have ever looked in a non-comic book format. The Flash looks incredible. I love the suit. And even though I greatly prefer simpler suits when it comes to the Flash, this techie, somewhat armored suit is fantastic. The hue of red contrasted by the black padding and bright yellow logo and ear spoilers is great looks super sleek, and the built-in goggles are beautiful. Green Lantern looks super dope. He's relatively basic, a little similar to Injustice 2's Green Lantern, who looks pretty good. But what puts Suicide Squad's Green Lantern over the top for me is how the actual green on his suit looks. It's like a mix of holographic and crystallic, plus the way it subtly blooms and radiates works so well. I also really like his face. Looks like a relatively young Jon Stewart. I don't think anything could have ever topped Batman's Arkham Knight suit for me, since that suit is god tier, especially in the rain. But I have to say this one kind of beats it out. It's sleek, the gray versus black ratio is perfectly tuned, tons of detail in the armor plating that doesn't look cluttered, the cowl looks sick, and the cape is fucking perfection. In standard lighting, it looks pretty good, but in dark environments, it really shines. The purple eyes definitely help too. Wonder Woman has honestly never looked better to me. I love this nomadic, battle-hardened warrior take on her. The asymmetrical armor, her hairstyle, and the shawl work wonders. It's so good. I also really adore how Greek she looks. And Superman, best looking Superman ever. The shade of blue, the chrome red of his crest, and the orangish yellow is an absolutely eye-watering color palette. His physique is flawless, and his hair and his face are also absolute perfection. This is Superman. I feel like whoever was the lead character designer for Superman was watching a lot of Shrek 2 over and over and over again because his resemblance to human Shrek is uncanny. The characters in general look incredible, and they sound even better. The vocal performances are top shelf. Everyone did their jobs, and then some. Tara Strong killed it as Harley, as always. I watched a lot of Samoa Joe in his TNA days, and I never thought he would be voice acting, but he does a great job as King Shark, who's basically Drax, but still has his own charm to him. Bumper Robinson embodies Deadshot to a T. He does Floyd's subdued cockiness and envy well, while also going all out in moments of anger, and especially when his claustrophobia kicks in. Oh yeah, Deadshot. Uh, what? Shut up, shut up, shut up, just shut up! I hate small spaces, I hate losing, I need air, and I'm stuck in here with you assholes! But when it comes to the squad, Daniel LePayne as Captain Boomerang stole the show for me. When I was hearing them throughout the entire game, I would often say stuff like, Hey, Tara is killing it, or Samoa Joe is doing great, you know? Passively complimenting the performances and associating the characters with their voice talent. But when it came to Boomerang, I was just hearing Boomerang. It's very similar to seeing Hugh Jackman in a movie and just calling him Wolverine because he is Wolverine. He owns that role, and that is what Daniel LePayne has done with Captain Boomerang. It's his role now. Yeah, go Superman! Oh, fuck, it's Superman! The rest of the cast also do a great job. Deborah Wilson plays a very ruthless version of Waller. Nolan North as the Penguin is as good as he was in the Arkham games. Amono Okoji is great as Hack. Christopher Sean as Hiro Okamura is great. The way he makes Hiro sound so overly optimistic and innocent is fantastic. Corey Buxton nails Lex Luthor. Darcy Rose Burns, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, is stellar as an adolescent Poison Ivy, nailing all of the teenage mannerisms I despise the more I grow up. Seychelle Gabriel as Lois Lane was 
was great. She practically carried the game's sense of tragedy on her back. Jason Isaacs as Brainiac was a 12 out of 10 casting. He's so casually menacing and sounds like an alien genius whose hubris knows no bounds. And what kind of person would I be if I didn't mention Wally Wingert coming back as the Riddler? With a conundrum, why would Argus choose you for this mission over me? Hearing his voice again after nine years had me feeling like the food critic from Ratatouille. And when it comes to the Justice League, their voices are a big deal to me because of the Justice League I grew up with. I watched the original Justice League animated show a ton as a kid, alongside Justice League Unlimited, of course. So when I think of Superman, I think of George Newbern. When I think of Batman, Kevin Conroy, Wonder Woman, Susan Eisenberg, Green Lantern, Phil Lamar, and Flash, Michael Rosenbaum. And Carl Lumbly as Martian Manhunter. I know he's not in this game, but still deserves a shout out nonetheless. So the only constant in this game is Kevin Conroy as Batman, and he was phenomenal in this game. He played a terrifying Batman, almost like he was a serial killer. Just hearing him talk throughout the entire game, antagonizing you constantly, almost always gave me chills. But that leaves the rest of the league, and how do I think they did? I think the new voice cast for these characters did amazing. I want to start off with Scott Porter as The Flash. I'm a big fan of Scott's work, he's awesome as Heimdall in God of War Ragnarok, and the role I remember him the most for is Damian Wayne in Injustice 2, and his performance as The Flash is stellar. Before he's corrupted, Flash has the speedy delivery and earnest cockiness to him, almost like he's ready to bolt to rescue anyone at any second. Speedster secret! The League doesn't leave anyone behind. Let's make you right, buddy. But after he's corrupted, he gets so sinister. His cockiness is now purely patronizing, and his inherent ego turns into unhinged mania. Okay, obviously. But how are you going to bench the fastest man alive? Just listen to him during the second half of his boss fight when he starts to realize he might actually lose. He is manic, dude. Those fights are going to step on themselves, guys! Try to Then we have Dan White as Green Lantern, who sounds a little green, but has more than enough experience under his belt, and speaks a little militantly. He's condescending and overly confident in his abilities, constantly calling you convicts, and always picking on Deadshot. Yellow lanterns? Better be- <laughs> Did you get those from a gumball machine? Damn, they're tiny! I really like this voice for John. I would love to hear more of a non-corrupted Green Lantern. Superman is voiced by Nolan North. I came to really like his performance as Superman. In the main campaign, you don't hear much of him since he's only in the game for like 15 minutes and he's corrupted during that time frame anyway. But hearing his non-corrupted self in the Hall of Justice holograms and especially in the audio logs sold me on this Superman. When I was even younger than you, my world was dying. So my mom and dad sent me to a beautiful blue planet far away. Some really nice people raised me, even though I came from another world. Even though I was different. I love this world. My friends. And yes, even Batman. Nolan really does capture Superman, the one I know and love. He's super friendly, incredibly kind, and an amazing person all around, which are things we haven't seen much of from this character in recent years. I love his interactions with Batman in the audio logs as well. Look, you're a smart guy, Bruce. The smartest guy I know. But you've got to let us help. Ah, you're right. I'll take a few hours off to sleep. Happy. Elated. Just do me one more favor. Take the cowl off first. And then we have Zara Fossil as Wonder Woman, and she was amazing. Honestly, I hope she is a new prominent voice of Wonder Woman going forward, similar to how Yuri Lewenthal basically took over Spider-Man. She has an advantage in this game compared to the other League members in terms of expressing her true character, since she's never corrupted throughout the story. She's not a fish out of water like the DCEU version of her, nor is she a selfish psychopath like she is in Injustice. Suicide Squad's Wonder Woman is fairly accustomed to the ways outside of Themyscira, and throughout the story, she's constantly conflicted. She knows that she most likely will have to kill her closest friends, but she's in denial, thinking that there is some way to save them. That is until this moment with the Flash and the Lasso of Truth, which is one of my favorite moments in the game. She's interrogating him to tell her how to stop Brainiac while he's laughing hysterically, but after a little bit of time, she stops interrogating him and starts pleading, and the way she says his name, I legitimately felt the pain in her voice. Of course we'll have to kill every man, 
woman bent child to do it, even the dogs. Oof. Barry! Please, tell me how. This performance from Zara is fantastic. I love this version of Wonder Woman so much. Everyone involved in bringing this character to life, just know that I really, really appreciate you. I really hope I get to see her again. Here's to hoping, I guess. Even though we don't get much time to explore this version of the Justice League, they left a great impression on me. I really do like these iterations of these characters, and I would love to see more of them in the future. And I still haven't talked about the most important character in the game, and that is Metropolis. Ever since I was a kid, Metropolis has been my favorite comic book city. It's so colorful, and it has such beautiful retro-futurist architecture and aesthetics that barely any other comic book city could match. I grew very attached to this specific image of Metropolis thanks to the original Superman animated series, alongside a couple of Superman games like Shadow of Apocalypse, which to me is still the best Superman game ever made, and the 2002 Man of Steel game. I have played a lot of open world games and there are very few open worlds that I would claim that I genuinely love and can't stop thinking about revisiting. That very small list includes The Lands Between, Tsushima Island, Gotham City, Kamurocho, and this place from Gravity Rush 2. And before anyone mentions Night City, I haven't played Cyberpunk yet, I'm sorry. After spending a lot of hours traversing and strolling through Metropolis, scaling its skyscrapers and walking its streets, I have no choice but to add it to the list. I cannot get over how amazing the city looks. I shouldn't be surprised considering how much I adore Arkham Knight's Gotham City, but each time I boot up this game, I can't help but marvel at Suicide Squad's Metropolis. The scale, the density, how much personality each district has, there was so much love put into crafting this world. What I truly love the most is how much this this city really cherishes its greatest heroes. It helps that it just so happened to be Justice Day when Brainiac invaded, so there's decorations of the League basically everywhere you go. But outside of that, there's this comic book district before the Daily Planet that has this big Flash statue emerging out of it, a huge Wonder Woman replica alongside Batman's mask and Lantern's ring, not to mention this huge golden statue of Superman in Centennial Park with his emblem printed on the ground too. Seeing how much this city genuinely loved the Justice League adds to the tragedy of them slaughtering civilians in the blink of an eye. Not to mention just how many references there are to the broader DC universe like Green Arrow and Booster Gold and Blue Beetle and Deathstroke and Black Manta and Peacemaker. It's packed with Easter eggs almost everywhere you go and I'm going to have so much fun watching Batman Arkham videos uncover more and more of them as the game goes on. So that's more than enough of me gushing my brains out about this game's visuals and presentation. Let's finally talk about the meat of Suicide Squad, the gameplay itself, which for me has a lot of incredible highs as well as baffling lows. Suicide Squad is a looter shooter. It is not an Arkham game, it has Arkhamisms for sure, but no matter which way you spin it, it is a looter shooter, which is an interesting direction to take with DC characters. I love the Arkham games and the new Spider-Mans just as much as the next guy, but I do heavily appreciate different gameplay spins on superheroes that don't strictly follow the tried and true formula that Arkham Asylum created long ago. Because after Spider-Man 2, and I do like this game, don't get me wrong, the formula for me is starting to stale. So, a super action-packed traversal-based shooter valiantly carrying on the legacies of Crackdown and Sunset Overdrive, two franchises that will unfortunately never get entries again, is quite refreshing to me. In comparison to other looter shooters, Suicide Squad is the most fun looter shooter I have ever played. And I've played a lot of looter shooters and loot-driven games. I love Borderlands, I really liked Division 1, never got around to 2 unfortunately, and Destiny 2, once I got past the intro, was actually a pretty fun time. But Suicide Squad's gameplay formula is just crack to me, like the gameplay foundation here I think is very strong. From time to time I will boot up certain games just to move around in because freedom of movement is one of my favorite things in video games. Some days I will just boot up Spider-Man just to swing around, or Gravity Rush 2 to fly, or Bomb Rush Cyberfunk to grind, or Sonic Frontiers just to run around, or Marvel 3 to Plink Dash. I adore moving. And on top of that, if you're able to seamlessly integrate combat into it to the point where traversal and combat are inseparable components, then you have succeeded in creating a game just for me. It has been a long time since a third person action game has expertly nailed that balance between movement and combat for me. I am talking way back in the days of Prototype, 
Sunset Overdrive, and Spider-Man Web of Shadows. On a side note, Papa Phil, please remaster Spider-Man Web of Shadows. Thank you. Movement in this game is always satisfying, no matter who it is I'm playing as. Harley is basically Spider-Man, and it's really fun to trapeze around with her and shoot shit while swinging, although I do wish she swung around faster and had more movement tech. Boomerang using the speed force to sprint and teleport around is so dope. Throwing his boomerang around and him catching up to it to get behind enemies is never not cool. Shark jumps. And it works. He's basically Hulk from the Incredible Hulk Ultimate Destruction game way back in the day. And Deadshot's jetpack really surprised me because during the game's marketing cycle, I thought he had the most boring method of traversal, but after actually playing as him, he's my favorite character to move around with. It never gets old, iron manning my way out of tight spots, quickly ascending, hovering around, and getting headshots, and also propelling my way through the city. This is the closest thing I have to a modern day Superman game, so I will cherish the joy of moving around as Deadshot with all my heart. And regarding the combat, I think the gunplay and gameplay loop is very fun. Movement plays a huge part in it, obviously, but shooting and killing stuff feels good. One of my initial worries about this game was how much was happening on screen at once, not just in the UI department which got memed on like crazy, thankfully you can turn most of this off, but just how many enemies were on screen, all the effects, the explosions, and the damage numbers. But after playing it, none of it really bothered me. I grew to love how frantic and chaotic encounters were, especially how vertical they are. A good chunk of them felt like war zones where if you ever stopped moving, you were as good as dead. The damage numbers, the colorful explosions, and effects everywhere just tickled that itch in my monkey brain, you know? The game is very loot focused, so loot was another thing I was curious to see in motion, and in terms of building loadouts and choosing gear, similar to how I feel about the gameplay, I think they have a really strong foundation here. I really like that none of the gear is level gated, the gear is not cosmetic so you aren't stuck with a look that's tied to an item, the gear synergies that unlock in the endgame are super sick, and the current level of weapon customization with augments and stuff is good. Could be better but good. This game's build crafting aspect does make you feel like you can create a levy of playstyles to choose from since min-maxing isn't always the way to overcome some challenges. I spent a considerable amount of time in the loadout and skill tree menus trying out a bunch of different builds and weapons, and I never got bored of it. I was constantly interested to see just how much more I could play around with. As I've said before, I think Suicide Squad is the most fun looter shooter I have ever played, but is it the best looter shooter I have ever played? No. I think the game has a fair amount of issues that all basically boil down to this statement, there needs to be more. Starting off with the characters themselves, they're all fun and very distinct in how they move around, but that's basically about it and I think that is a huge missed opportunity. They all shoot the same, have the same counter shot effects, and have the same categories of abilities. All of the traversal attacks are big AoE attacks, suicide strikes are flashy cinematic finishers, and each one has the same squad ultimate, which slows down time. Melee in this game is very bare bones, it's more of a resource collection move like Doom Eternal's Chainsaw. Combos would be cool, air combos would be even cooler, turn this bitch into DMC, you know, let let Shark and Harley go fucking wild. The characters need two or three more things in their kits to give them more depth, while also creating new team synergies. It makes sense to me that they would use guns a lot, but given who these characters are with their pre-established legacies, it seems like a waste not to give them traits of their own. Let's take Borderlands for example. Each character in Borderlands shoots guns the same way and whatnot, but they also have drastically different abilities and skill trees, which in themselves are very customizable. It's a big reason why I can keep coming back to Borderlands and have a completely new experience with each playthrough. I have my own set of suggestions for each character, which are as follows. For Harley, one ability could be her signature giant mallet. This ability could basically be like Doomfist's punch in Overwatch and be a damaging crowd control move. She can disperse waves of enemies by knocking them back and if they're slammed into walls, they are stunned and are susceptible to triple damage for a few seconds. Another ability I suggest would be her present bombs, which could be multifunctional. She can put them on the ground or tie a balloon to them and have them float through the air, and in these present bombs there are a variety of things decided by either RNG or the player's choosing. If the team is in a rough fight and needs support, they could be filled with shields, and the longer the present is in the air before it gets shot down by another teammate, the more shields it will produce. Or it could be filled with hundreds of grenades that just hail from the sky, or maybe fill it with damage boosters, afflictions, why not one of Gizmo's cars in missions where they don't spawn, or maybe Ivy's special plants or something. And my third ability suggestion for her would just be giving her Bud and Lou and having them act like summons where they just maul every enemy they come across for a certain amount of time. That'd be cool. 
For Boomerang, since he uses the Speed Force, he could be something like a support character. One ability would be him being able to grab teammates and zip them out of danger, phasing through walls, or just grabbing them on his way to his boomerang when he throws it to someplace. This can give your teammate a new vantage point or some much needed elevation. Or another idea is that when he throws his boomerang to a teammate and they grab it, they are instantly ported back to where boomerang is. The second ability would be based on how the flash throws a lightning bolt, but adjusted to where boomerang channels a lightning bolt and transfers it to his boomerang. So he throws a boomerang out in the distance and on its way back to him, it shocks nearby enemies and completely slows them down by 75% or something. Or the more enemies that get shocked, the more movement speed the squad gets. And for his third ability, just let him make a speed force cyclone of his own. He saw Flash and Brainiac do it, why can't he? Once he creates one, it travels in a set direction for a short amount of time and sucks enemies into it, creating a vacuum that your team can open fire on. Or have them get thrown across the map and receive slam damage or something. And if your teammates jump into the cyclone, they get funneled to the top of it and get a huge aerial movement boost or something. For Deadshot, he's his own dude and he doesn't really do anything to support the team per se. One ability would be him being able to ricochet bullets for double or triple damage. Let him do some cool trick shots, you know, let him flex. Another ability could be a recon scan where he sees through walls while it's active and alongside seeing through walls, he can shoot through them. Giving him that sense of being a true sharpshooter where not even solid matter can get in his way of killing his target while also letting him be the only squad member that can utilize cover. And his third ability could be... Uh... I don't know. He shoots guns, bro. What more can be done with him? Just let him shoot explosive bullets or something. And for King Shark, just let him be the Hulk. One ability would be able to grab enemies and objects. He can pick up abandoned cars and debris and just chuck them wherever he wants. He picks up enemies and does giant swings or power bombs or other vicious wrestling finishers that have AOE properties. If the vehicular enemies are below 50%, he can pick those up too. He can chuck the tanks or grab onto the helicopters and swing them in a general direction. These are the only enemies that can't be suicide striked, so Shark being the only character that would be capable of using them as extra tools of destruction would be perfect. On top of giving him a grab, he could also grab his teammates gently of course, and chuck them way high in the air. For his second ability, he could magically douse himself in Atlantean waters and turn himself into a wrecking ball. He'd be able to sonic spin dash on command, pinball off of shit, and bulldoze his way through enemies, and if he's moving fast enough for a certain amount of time, he can perform super high damaging homing attacks. Really embrace his inner blue hedgehog, you know? For his third ability, he just bites and eats enemies. He does a default chomp attack, and if it kills, he gets a stack of bloodlust, which multiplies his chomp attack damage by 100%. And it can stack up to 10 times, and when he gets to the 10th stack, he goes full feral for a bit and doesn't use guns anymore. His health quadruples and he doesn't get interrupted or knocked down when taking damage anymore. He just keeps chomping until the effect wears off or he uses it to insta-kill a brute enemy. And in this state, he'd still have access to his non-weapon abilities. These are suggestions that will most likely not happen, but hopefully the cast gets new stuff to play with. Especially since they plan on adding more characters, there needs to be more things that they specialize in. The next area of weakness is the pace of earning cool-ass loot. There is a sizable amount of really cool stuff in the game, but most of it is locked behind the endgame and the increasingly harder invasion difficulties. The Bane loot and their infamy sets and tiers of synergy are really cool, but that's only if you invest a considerable amount of time into the game. Throughout the story campaign, you don't get a lot of very interesting loot, which is not a great way of teasing better loot or even incentivizing players to give a shit about earning it after the campaign. I think they missed out on doing special Justice League themed guns after each fight. After the Flash, you get like a Flash themed SMG that gives you insane movement speed for each second that you fire it, or a Green Lantern themed minigun that spawns construct weaponry behind you as you're shooting for a lot more damage, or a Batman themed sniper rifle that turns you invisible, or just teleports you to the location of an enemy you just killed with, you know, smoke bombs and bats flying out of the smoke and everything or a Superman shotgun that has alternative fire options like a laser beam that grows bigger and does more damage the longer it's out, and if it's out for too long, it starts damaging everyone around you, including the squad. Or a Wonder Woman themed pistol that actively deflects incoming projectiles to nearby enemies while aiming down sights or something. Just anything to show off how cool and interesting the loot can be while going through the campaign. But what good are exotic guns and extensive build crafting capabilities if you barely have anything to use them on? 
which brings us to enemy variety, and it's pretty lacking at the moment. There's a few types of grunts, like shotgunners and snipers, and a couple of type of brutes and vehicular enemies, but that's really about it. There are these special superhero themed variants, like the flash infused enemies who speed around the battlefield, helicopters that are covered in Green Lantern's protection, and Batman infused enemies who are cloaked and don't appear on your minimap, so you have to keep a keen eye on where they are. You fight the same enemies for the entire game, and that's not inherently a bad thing. One of my favorite games of all time is Dead Rising, and every zombie is the same. And I've been playing a decent chunk of Helldivers 2, it's awesome by the way, which doesn't have the most robust roster of enemies, but the way the game is set up, they do pose a challenge and constantly have you thinking about what to use and when to use it. It feels dynamic as opposed to Suicide Squad feeling static despite how kinetic and chaotic this game is. In a game like this that highly emphasizes player expression, embraces each character being a one-man army, and where the narrative context of Brainiac creating inorganic synthetic creatures to do his bidding creates ample opportunity to create some really cool enemies, there have to be more types that do more than just stand there and shoot you. The benefit of this would be more challenge for one, and really being able to put your builds and abilities to the test. Something to change up the pace of fights. Like the Marauder from Doom Eternal. Everyone loves that guy, right? You are wrong! All of you are wrong! Speaking of needing more things to kill, it needed way more to do. The entire mission pool of this game, both main and side content, is like five or six missions that rotate on a cycle with an occasional boss fight. This is another huge missed opportunity because cycling through the same types of missions that have little to no narrative dressing make them feel like they aren't working in tandem with the narrative to tell a story, and that feels unfulfilling. There's only like two set piece missions that differentiate themselves from the rest, both of which revolve around Batman, and they both function almost the exact same. Playing through the main campaign, while I found it fun since the gameplay did the heavy lifting for me, just had me underwhelmed in terms of the mission variety. Throughout the 10 hour campaign, it constantly felt like the game was priming me for the post game rather than focusing on delivering a unique campaign experience where it feels like I am actually accomplishing something relative to the narrative. Something that would make me want to go back and replay story segments, but it doesn't matter because what you do in the campaign is exactly what you will be doing in the post game, and even then, there's only three missions in the post game right now. There's not a lot to do at the moment. The main campaign being the way it is, is one thing, but what really bummed me out was the side content, because there practically is none. The most you get are these affiliate missions for the specific vendors you meet like Penguin and Ivy and Hack and Torman, and the more of them you do, the more stuff you can receive and do at these vendors, but these missions just cycle through a set pool of 1-2 to two missions that you do over and over again with very little narrative dressing, and as a result, you don't learn anything about these characters or the city itself. These missions could have fleshed out these characters more in ways that felt personal to them. For Toy Man, since he's a huge Superman fanboy, he could have asked you to take pictures of various Superman statues and landmarks where Superman saved the city or where Hero actually got to meet his hero to preserve his image of who Superman was before the invasion. Or for Hack, you could have done recon missions where she's trying to find a way to leave her human body behind for good so she isn't under Waller's thumb. Just something anything. I've already raved enough about Metropolis, but the downside to it is that it doesn't make the most of its locale or its people. The only thing available are the Riddler challenges, and I had fun scanning locations and hunting for trophies like old times, but that's all there is to do. This was a prime opportunity to tell more stories about this very unique situation. They could have had missions where you had to locate various metahumans that went into hiding in Metropolis so that Brainiac wouldn't add them to his collection. It would have been really neat to see them scared for their lives knowing that they wouldn't be shown mercy any longer. One idea I had for a side story was Hack notices small power surges in the local power plant that no one else would detect and she sends the squad to investigate. And when you get there you do like a small electrical puzzle or something that reveals the cause of the surges 
and it ends up being Livewire, who has been hiding in the city's power lines for weeks. Or after Earth-1 Luther is killed, you uncover a partial plan of his where he was creating a weapon that utilizes kryptonite to kill Superman, and the weapon is super deep underground. So Ivy uses her vines to find an off-the-grid facility similar to how she found the Batcave, and when you find it, you discover an unfinished build of Metallo, and see a disfigured but alive John Corbin, who Luther has been experimenting on for a long time in order to kill Superman. And speaking of killing Superman, these boss fights, I don't think they're awful by any means. No, I lied. One of them I think is pretty terrible. But they are severely lacking. These are Suicide Squad's biggest misses by far. If they nailed these bosses, and only these bosses, even with the game's other shortcomings, I guarantee you its reception would have been way better. It would have made up for the lack of enemy and mission variety, which is exactly what Final Fantasy XVI did. That game had me bored out of my mind doing its normal missions that felt like they were there just to waste my time. But all of that monotony and tediousness was forgiven every time I encountered a boss because the bosses in that game are fucking awesome. I cannot say the same for Suicide Squad. Let me say this before I talk extensively about the bosses. Rocksteady has never had the greatest track record of boss fights. Mr. Freeze in Arkham City is the GOAT, obviously, and there were some other decent ones here and there. Arkham Knight's collection of bosses were pretty poor in my opinion, especially the Deathstroke one. Holy moly, that upset me. In comparison to Arkham Knight, on a gameplay level, I had more fun fighting Suicide Squad's bosses, but given who you are fighting in Suicide Squad, they feel like completely wasted potential. First one up is The Flash. He's fast, he runs around like a rat, and he's very hard to hit with bullets. Or at least, that is what you would think he would be like. In his boss fight, he is fast, he does run around like a rat, but he is very easy to hit with bullets. For some reason, he willingly stands sentry while charging his Kamehameha, and when he's done, you have a very lenient window to counter shot him and fill him with lead before he runs off and does it again for the entire fight. This is the main thing he does. As it goes on, he does like two more things, which are the cyclones and the speed force bomb things, and that's it. There's no strategy, no real teamwork required, no hurdle to overcome, just move around, wait for a counter shot icon to pop up, counter shot, shoot, rinse and repeat until he's dead. What I just described with the flash applies to every other boss fight in the game. Green Lantern hovers around, spawns constructs that you shoot and destroy, counter shot him, shoot him, and do all of that over and over again until he dies. He only creates a few constructs as well. Where's your imagination, John? Superman, the most threatening League member that they hyped up as the unstoppable boogeyman for almost the entire game because he is fucking Superman, also requires the same methods of attack. Move around, counter shot, shoot until dead, and he only does a few things, all of which are incredibly telegraphed. Brainiac is just a reskin of the Flash fight, except he retreats to his healing bubble like a bitch, Face me, coward. spawns enemies so that you can stock up on ammo and shields, and fires galactic lasers. This is the final fight of the campaign, by the way. Based on where the story is going, I get why he would be a clone boss. I honestly wouldn't have even minded the fact that he was a clone boss if he just merged all of the League's powers together like Super Scroll. Imagine Flash with Freeze Breath or Superman using Lantern's Ring, but unfortunately not. Then we have Batman. I have saved the best for last because I think he is the worst boss in the game. Visually, it's an absolute stunner, and I think it's really cool that they made you fight Nightmare Batman from the end of Arkham Knight, but gameplay-wise, he is the most boring one to fight. What was the idea here? At least with the other bosses, you have to constantly move around and think about positioning a little bit. Here, you are stuck on this singular platform, can't use any of your movement abilities, and you just empty clips into this giant demon bat who chucks extremely slow-moving projectiles at you. Everything about this fight is just a missed opportunity all the way down to its concept. It would have been way cooler if you had to fight Nightmare Batman in the Batcave who was hunting you like he did in the old Arkham games. In order to beat him, you had to be super attentive to vents and grates and rock formatted perches up in the rafters or something and shoot him out of his cover and as you fight him, his phases would change the environment. You go from the Batcave to Arkham Asylum to Arkham City to Gotham City as a way to reward longtime fans of the Arkham games. Something to make you feel like you were on the other end of the Predator sections in the Arkham games, but now you had a fighting chance. This approach to Batman's boss fight was the least interesting thing they could have done with him. 
The bosses in general suffer from the same thing the main characters do, which is that they have very little depth to them. This is the Justice League, who have forfeited their sworn no-kill rules. They have nothing holding them back from trying to murder you, yet they don't do enough. They don't promote teamwork at all, and the most important aspect that they fail to have is being bullshit. These bosses should be son of a bitch rat bastards who have such unfair advantages against four talented killers. Give them unseeable insta-kills. Let the Flash rip your heart out by running past you or run back in time to regain all of his health unless you actually stop him. Let Lantern bubble up a couple of squad members and slowly crush them to death until someone breaks his will. Let Superman command grab incapacitated teammates and chuck them all the way across the map so someone has to leave the fight to go pick them up, leaving only two squad members up against Superman. This was the perfect situation where you as a studio could get away with creating the most infuriating and bullshit ass bosses ever, and if people complained, that means you succeeded. Imagine if the squad, who are more than capable of one man arming Brainiac's forces, now have to actually work as a team and fulfill unique roles in taking down a Justice League member. The way the bosses are now, they just feel like dumb, underpowered doppelgangers who have no idea how to use their powers, so when you do take them down, it always feels cheap, empty, and unearned. You know what else feels unearned? The ending of this game. Yep, it's finally time to discuss the story. So, the story. Let me start by saying that I think the first half of the story is very strong. You get introduced to the squad, who are then tunneled into the Hall of Justice, being kept in the dark by Waller. They get some traversal gear, and then they head out to the rooftop and see the invasion for the first time, and have no idea what the fuck is going on. Then they see Green Lantern, and notice something is not quite right with them, and witness civilians being morphed into minions. Then the Flash shows up and saves the squad from guaranteed death, and he gets hurt in the process. They drag him into the Arkham Museum for extraction, where Boomerang accidentally cuts off his thumb before Batman makes his introduction as a twisted serial killer. Then Batman jumps the squad and nearly kills Harley before Flash risks his life to save them again. I love the way they show Flash's undying heroism. This dude is bleeding out and near incapacitated and still musters up enough energy to barely nudge this bullet away from Harley's head and gets captured and corrupted for it. That's my goat right there. Then the squad go back into the hall and get into the inner sanctum thanks to Flash's thumb, get jumped by non-corrupted Wonder Woman, are tasked to kill the Justice League, get their costumes, and from there the game truly starts. The setup is superb. It does a great job of using the squad as a vessel so that players are just as confused as they are at what they're looking at. The decision to make Wonder Woman the sole survivor of the League was a great choice to flesh out her character and express how conflicted she is since she's no stranger to killing. They could have easily opted Batman to be the sole survivor since, you know, it's his universe. It would have been neat to see him work with the squad to take down the League, and he has contingencies for each member, so it would have been the easiest route to take. But for me, I've seen Batman in this role quite a bit where it's him versus the League, either literally or ideologically. So it's nice to see a different character with a different skill set, different methodology, and different way of thinking thrust into a situation like this. The overall momentum of the story in the first half just hits all the marks for me. It introduces characters at a very nice pace, the prospect of killing the League grows more daunting the more they're on screen, and there's a lot of really cool story moments. I've already highlighted this scene with Flash and Wonder Woman enough, uh, this moment where Deadshot tries to snipe Flash after he spears Lex Luthor out of his power suit is incredible. Take the shot already! That's the Flash? You might as well post him the bullet! Did you get him? Ugh. Hey, demon! <laughs> you know it's gone to hell when you went. Really? Why don't you just mail me the bullet? I love, like, love, love, love the fact that Boomerang knows the Flash so goddamn well that he makes the same joke as he does without any coordination whatsoever. The squad have great chemistry together, constantly taunting and ripping into each other before all of that animosity between them blossoms into genuine, fucked up friendship because of what they go through together. Everything clicks for a while until 
after the Flash is killed. From here, this is where the story feels like it is rushing through what are supposed to be its landmark moments, shuttling you straight to the endgame instead. The multiverse is introduced, which I kind of figured would happen since the Flash is in this game, and even though he isn't directly responsible for introducing the multiverse, it is kind of funny that he was involved, albeit indirectly. They spend like 15 minutes in the multiverse, find out that Brainiac's invasion is multiversal, meet Earth 2 Lex Luthor, make it back to their Earth, and don't go back until the last mission. It feels like an odd place to plant the seed of the multiverse because it's just constantly on the back of your mind at this point. It actively deflates the stakes when the game is clearly trying to elevate them. Now whatever happens for the rest of the game feels a bit moot because any risk taken can just be amended. I don't mind that the multiverse is a part of the story, I like that Brainiac's invasion isn't limited to one dimension, and taking a peek into the vast possibilities and unknowns of Elseworlds is sick, but it's brought in at the wrong time. What it results in are the marquee moments of the game feeling like afterthoughts, which are the deaths of the Justice League. All five of them do die, and congratulations, I'm glad that they followed through on their tagline. I thought they were going to cop out in some way, and that would have sucked. But the way they end up going out, compounded with weak boss fights, is disappointing to say the least. Three of them plop on the floor and just die, including Superman, who gets 15 minutes of screen time at best after the entire game treats him as an unkillable boogeyman. He caught a nuke, launched it outside of the city, and then nuked Wonder Woman to Ash, which I call bullshit on, by the way. There's no reason she should have gotten her guard broken with how strong she is and how indestructible her bracelets are. Like, she didn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with him for 20 minutes, but whatever. Although, choosing to craft a kryptonite shield over a kryptonite sword... Kind of fucked yourself over there, Diana, I'm not gonna lie. Back to Superman. When you kill him, he rages out like he's about to enter a third phase where he's completely unhinged and off the rails, and he just falls to the ground and dies. Probably hit his head too hard or something. They gave Superman such a weak death, man. There could have been an ending cinematic where he's about to nuke laser the entire city, but I don't know, Shark laces his teeth with gold kryptonite or something and bites a huge chunk out of him, causing him to bleed out and die. Better yet, this fight could have been the squad backing up Wonder Woman to kill the last corrupted Justice League member, where you whittle Superman down and distract him long enough for Wonder Woman to try and neutralize him. And she tries to pacify him over and over, but he keeps getting back up. So as a last resort, she shoves kryptonite through his heart and he starts to bleed out, and before he dies, he delivers a killing blow of his own to Wonder Woman, who then dies shortly after. Two birds with one stone. But no, he legitimately just feels like filler to introduce Brainiac. Lantern and Flash's deaths relatively had more to them. Shark commemorates the Flash, because they all know they would have been dead two times over if it wasn't for him, before Boomerang tries to piss on him, and they end up going to the multiverse that way. And Shark ends up using Lantern's suspicious ring that's not supposed to work the way it does to destroy the Skull Ship's shield, which opens up some interesting plot elements as to what may be going on with the League and Brainiac's invasion. As for Wonder Woman and Batman, they are the only two who got send-offs. Wonder Woman dies a hero's death, and it's a sad moment given how hard she was fighting to save lives and end this nightmare. Batman's death is an interesting one to talk about because the majority's consensus of his death is that it is unfulfilling, wrong, and ruins Arkham Batman's legacy. And I understand the perspectives. He was the main protagonist for four Arkham games, and a lot of people, including me, grew very attached to this version of the character, so for him to die the way he did, not as a hero risking his life for others, but as a villain, executed on a park bench by Harley Quinn while still being under Brainiac's control, not being allowed to right his wrongs or face his own evil before going out was surely going to piss a lot of people off. It's cruel, disrespectful, and unfair. Which is why I like his death in this game. Or at least the idea of it. Hear me out. Brainiac's invasion is cruel and unfair. He just rolls up one day, snatches the League up because of Superman's overtrusting nature, turns them against the people they swore to protect, and genocides Metropolis in the process. The situation is bleak and hopeless. Earth's greatest heroes are now being puppeted by Brainiac and are no longer the upstanding people that they used to be. They are practically dead already. Majority have said that this game shouldn't have taken place in the Arkhamverse due to reasons such as inconsistencies like Deadshot being a completely different race, which I did find weird. Don't get me wrong, this version of Deadshot is 
way cooler than the other one, but the excuse that they give that the original one was an imposter that Waller had assassinated is not the most creative route they could have taken. Perhaps if they expanded on how he encountered Green Lantern prior to the events of this game, I would have been more convinced. And the other big reason it shouldn't have taken place in the Arkhamverse is because this completely destroys Arkham Batman's legacy. And I don't completely agree with that. This game celebrates its heroes through its world, and it especially loves Batman. The entire Batman experience, the many nods to previous games, and the overall appreciation of his past efforts. Could they have saved themselves from all of the heat they got if they just set this in an Arkhamverse adjacent universe? Hell yes. But if they went the route of making this a new universe with a completely different Batman, then this death would have practically meant nothing, which is already an issue with the other League members. I spent so much time with this character and went on so many adventures with him, watching him put his life on the line, making tough sacrifices, overbearing himself with responsibilities that weren't his, and never wavering his principles even in the most dire situations. That is the hero we all know and love. This Batman in Suicide Squad is not that hero anymore. The game goes out of its way twice to firmly illustrate that Arkham Batman as of right now is no more. After he is defeated and gets taken to Luther's lab, he is strapped down to a bed and starts to say his iconic line. You've already lost, Luther. I am vengeance. I am hey. the Though this moment seems like it is purely for cheap laughs at Batman's expense, let me ask you this. Have you ever heard Batman not finish this line? It's his most iconic saying, and anytime it has been used in media before, it comes with great weight and impact, signaling his determination and unbreakable will. I am vengeance. I am the knight. I am Batman. So when he gets interrupted by Luther, it signaled to me that this isn't the real Batman. And the other moment is after he is killed by Harley, she says, That's got the last laugh after all. Oh, he would have wanted this. The real Batman, I mean. And she's right. The real Batman would have wanted this. That was the whole point of this contingency video. Factoring all of that in, when he's sitting on the bench bloodied and about to get executed, I'm not thinking, this is so disrespectful, I can't believe Rocksteady wrote this for their most iconic character. I'm thinking, dude, this fucking sucks. The hero I idolized for so long is no longer the man he once was due to forces far too powerful for him. If he could see the evil he had done, he would be disgusted with himself, but unfortunately, he won't get the opportunity to make amends. Brainiac robbed him of his redemption. Sometimes people who do outstanding good don't get the send-offs they deserve. They get what the world gives them, whether it is just or not, and thanks to Brainiac, the world in this game is cruel and unfair. If even Batman, the smartest, most capable hero in the league, couldn't overcome Brainiac, then what chance does anyone else stand? That is what this moment is supposed to represent, and that is why I like the idea of Batman's death. You are now free to click on the dislike button if you haven't already. Could this moment have been written and built up to better though? Absolutely. I think the idea was there, I truly do, but it's so sloppily executed, which you can basically say about the game's entire story. These deaths don't have the impact they should because of a couple of things. The story's stakes feel nearly weightless since rarely, if ever, does it feel like the squad or their supporting cast are in danger. Instead, the most powerful beings in the story are the frail and brittle ones, so the power difference between the two groups feel inverted when it shouldn't be. The game's pacing doesn't do itself any favors either, and I don't think the game does a great job of expressing the overarching dread and tragedy of the situation. That is a tough thing to do considering that this game is told through the Suicide Squad's perspective, and they are a murderous and evil bunch who are only doing what they are doing because they will die if they don't. Their only options here are Death by Waller, or Death by Brainiac. I wouldn't expect these four to have any honor for the heroes they are killing because one, they don't like them, two, they're not good people, and three, the heroes are actively trying to kill them so why would they care? It's not Teen Titans kill the Justice League after all. Which though now that I've said it, that would have been a really cool idea. This is where having actual side stories within the city would have been incredibly beneficial for fleshing out the story and better expressing the gravity of the situation. For a game set in Metropolis, how many citizens of this city do we get to meet? Lex Luthor, Toy Man, Superman, 
and Lois Lane. Where's Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, some small-time Metropolis villains, Lena Luthor, maybe even Martha and Jonathan Kent who were visiting on Justice Day for Superman? Lois does almost all of the heavy lifting when it comes to the emotional moments of the game. She recaps the story's events with sorrow and disbelief while maintaining a strong face so that survivors don't lose all hope. Or I think that's a strong face. I don't know, they might have just not animated her. Anyways, she gives each hero a proper goodbye after they die, and I can't help but be moved by these segments. The Flash is dead. A dark end to a career marked by civic duty, protecting the innocent, and bringing hope and joy to his fans. A founding member of the Justice League, the Scarlet Speedster called Metropolis his second home after starting his crime-fighting career in Central City. I don't know how to say this. Wonder Woman is... gone. She was the only member of the Justice League to resist the corruption. All the way to the end. She was... She was killed... by Superman. To the end, she fought... for us. Against old friends and allies, she fought for us. I don't know what happens next. When she talks about Superman, she sounds distraught that her partner is actually gone for good. But she also uses this moment to remember the good Superman was known for and the hope he represented. Metropolis, this is Lois Lane, and the worst has come to pass. Superman is dead. Once the guiding light of the Justice League and a hero to the world. Superman's legacy was shattered by the events of the past few weeks and the devastating violence done by all those who once swore to protect us. But in times like this, it is not about being super. It is about being human. If there's one thing we can take from the Man of Steel we once knew, let it be his spirit of perseverance, resilience, and strength in the face of impossible odds. Again, amazing performances by Seychelles Gabriel. Lois was a great supporting piece for the game, and it needed more of that for its big moments to hit hard. So, with all five Justice League members dead, the task to kill the Justice League has been accomplished, so the last point of order is Brainiac, who I think looks, sounds, and is pretty sick. After the squad survived their first encounter with him, it is revealed that there are 13 total Brainiacs, and they must all be stopped to end the invasion. And then the squad go forth and vanquish one of the Brainiacs with the power of friendship. I was still having a lot of fun with the game despite its issues at that time, and I was like, cool, when do we start killing more Brainiacs and start seeing more of the story? I can't wait to see where we go from here. And then the game ends, only for a graphic to pop up on screen saying that the fight continues in Season 1, which thankfully comes out soon. I got Part 1 of what feels like a three-part story that will slowly trickle in over time and may not be complete for another two or so years if it even gets that far. It was at this point that I started to understand just how invasive the live service approach of this game was and retroactively pieced together that this game had to constantly compromise to meet that requirement. I already felt it before with the repetitive pool of missions and overall loot and vendor systems, but as the credits rolled, it was seemingly confirmed for me. The entire game felt like a constant push and pull between its divisions and the live service stuff, and the live service stuff always won out. And as of right now, the wrong side won. This is a fully priced game with a terrible deluxe edition, by the way, where you get what feels like one third of a game, which is a horrendous pricing decision, and I wouldn't expect any less from WB. This publisher is so fervent on getting their precious live service cash cow in a time where the rest of the industry, including Sony, are slowing their roll on that gold rush, and I don't know why. Hogwarts Legacy, a single player title last year, was a phenomenal success, yet they keep pushing. They tried with multiverses, didn't properly support that game well at all, and nearly killed it. Mortal Kombat 1 was released way too early, and the cash shop in that game is charging upwards of $10 a pop for skins and even fatalities. With Suicide Squad, it's an incomplete experience where the cash shop is charging $15 to $25 a pack for one character, and $5 an emote. 
$70 game. These skins should be two to five dollars at most, and the emotes should be free. Recently, a report from WB came out stating that the game fell short of their expectations. No kidding. You mandated a studio with no live service experience to make a live service game. And they have the audacity, the gall, to say that they want their future games to be live services when they can't even do one correctly. If the upcoming Wonder Woman game is another unfinished, fully priced live service, I will lose my goddamn mind. Because if or when these products fail, WB aren't going to be the ones affected. It's going to be the studios actually making these games that will suffer from layoffs, downsizing, and even potential closures. And I don't want that to be the case for Rocksteady. I don't want people to lose their jobs and talent to go to waste because of stupid corporate decisions. I just can't express enough how much I despise Warner Brothers. To reel it back in, despite my issues with the game, I still really enjoyed playing through Suicide Squad. And though I really dislike how the ending is handled, its open-ended nature does have me really interested to see how it all ends. Is this how I would have wanted this to play out? No, I would have greatly preferred a concise and uniquely constructed 20-hour campaign with proper DLC expansions afterwards, but it is what it is, this is the reality of the situation, and for some reason, they got me hooked. I really want to see where the game goes from here, and I really want to play more of it, so I suppose the last thing to talk about is what comes next. With how this game launched, there is a lot of concern and doubt about if this game will have a future. If you look at the numbers and the fact that WB released a statement about this game being a disappointment less than a month after launch, the answer is a resounding no. To me, the numbers make sense because again, 70 bucks with an awful monetization model. It also came out in a stacked time frame where there are so many other big time games coming out. Plus, the game isn't in a great technical state right now, and there's nothing to do at the moment. Once you have completed the campaign and gotten all of the Bane gear, it's an empty shooting gallery until Season 1 comes out. There's not even a battle pass to grind for either. It's like they released this a month too early. I, I don't get the strategy here. There's honestly nowhere to go but up from here for this game because it is currently at rock bottom. Once it goes on sale and gets more content, the player counts will go up because people want an excuse to play shit with their friends and more players will be playing for longer, which is usually what happens with live services. A lot of them don't hit the ground running and really need that first year to fix, populate, and reshape themselves into being viable products worth coming back to, unless your name is Helldivers 2 or the finals. And what I think could spearhead this game's potential redemption arc is if the story ends up going in the direction that I think it is, in a way that will give people what they have wanted for years at this point. I have already prefaced the video with a spoiler warning, but this is a double spoiler warning if you haven't seen or heard the leaks for the upcoming seasons. Three, two, one. Don't say I didn't warn ya. Recent leaks of the upcoming seasons have shown that Flash and Green Lantern will come back as their normal selves. One of my biggest theories throughout the game was that we were fighting clones of the League. The biggest hints were Flash magically regrowing his thumb, Green Lantern's ring not flying off of John's finger when he died, the fact that King Shark could use it, which was cool as fuck by the way, and the ring overtaking Shark and almost killing the squad. Alongside Brainiac saying, how did you kill my Justice League, and chatter amongst the squad about Brainiac recovering their bodies. The leaked audio suggests that the real League members did in fact die and are being resurrected instead, which I definitely prefer. I think it would be much more interesting to see the resurrected members haunted by the horrors they inflicted upon others, and see the way they take how they are now perceived by Metropolis and the rest of the world, knowing that they may never be trusted ever again. It could start out by killing one of the new Brainiacs to arrive that season, only to catch a hint that the League are recovering in an undisclosed location, so when Waller hears that, she gives Task Force X a new objective, and she goes like, Task Force X, your new mission is to save the Justice League. <laughs> If that happens and they rebrand the rest of the game to be Suicide Squad Save the Justice League, 
That would be the ultimate jingle shiny keys in my face moment and I would love every second of it. I imagine how it could go is that each season focuses on rescuing a newly resurrected hero and the order is The Flash in Season 1, GL in Season 2, Superman in Season 3, and Batman in Season 4. I assume Wonder Woman will be resurrected later on since she's quote unquote made of clay so she either gets remolded or comes back from the Well of Souls on Themyscira or The Flash does something with the Speed Force and puts Wonder Woman's ash is back together and then strikes her molded body with a speed force lightning bolt or just go the easier route and go back in time and save her. And from there, the League slowly recover until they are back in full force and they end up being playable at some point in time, which is full on copium for me, I am well aware. But remember, there are 12 more Brainiacs in Elseworlds left in their current plan. They have three more reskin bosses they are allowed to do before they have to get creative and expand upon boss designs because if it's just a circuit of reused bosses with no differentiation for the remaining 12 fights, that could fatally derail any momentum the game would have going for it. Just make sure the League band together to defeat the last remaining Brainiac or something and you'll be golden. I honestly can't wait to see what's coming down the pipeline for this game. Season 1 looks really cool. I for one really like this Elseworlds Joker design that looks heavily influenced by the Man Who Laughs silent film. I would love to see some characters join the squad like Peacemaker, Black Manta, and Deathstroke, but I would also want to see characters who don't use guns and how they would work like Katana, Cheetah, and Reverse Flash. I hope they go back and update the current bosses and make them much tougher once they have an understanding of their own meta, alongside new afflictions, new weapon types, yada yada yada. When I look at this game, I do think it has a bright future in terms of what it could end up being because it has a lot of potential to do some crazy cool stuff with the DC Universe that we haven't seen at a scope like this. Am I being too optimistic about this game's future? Admittedly, yes, because it comes with the grim likelihood that it will never get the chance to finish, which has been the common tale for most games who have entered this vicious space. There are stories of video games launching terribly only to make valiant comebacks, and I have experienced a couple of them firsthand. But those companies were committed to those products and were willing to stick it through thick and thin for large portions of time and change vital components of their strategy for the betterment of their product and their player base, and those stories are often anomalies. Do I expect Warner Brothers, the same company that willingly shelves fully made movies for bullshit tax purposes, to stick with this game long term given its abysmal start? I don't. This game most likely will not make it past the first year if things don't get better soon. For Rocksteady's sake, I hope they do get better and I hope they get the chance to finish their game. No matter what happens, unless I die of course, I do plan on being there when this game comes to an end, whether it be a triumphant finish or a highly likely premature death. That's it for me. I did not think this video would be an hour long when I wrote it. If you made it to the end, I do greatly appreciate your time and commitment. If you liked it, please leave a like and consider subbing. A dislike if you didn't. Let me know what you think of this game in the comments down below, and I will see you all when season one drops. Thank you so much for watching.